Merry Christmas. In this video, I want to explain to you how I figure out where your snoring and sleep apnea is coming from, from inside your throat, and why I do this test differently to everyone else. Now, the first thing is quite easy to understand. I'm not talking about how loud your snoring is or how bad your sleep apnea is, because you can work out how loud your snoring is from an app on the phone or looking at a sleep study that measures your breathing at night and figure out how bad your sleep apnea is. I'm trying to figure out where in your throat the problem is, which tissues are flapping around, generating the noise, which tissues are collapsing in and blocking your breathing. Because once I know how loud you are, how bad your sleep apnea is, if you have it or not, and also where the problems are in the tissues at the back of your throat, only then do I have a diagnosis. Only then I can say, ah, I know what the problem is. Now I can tell you which treatments will work on your individual problems, because everyone's slightly different. So I'll say, okay, you've got problem A, B, and C. Here are all the devices, the therapies, the exercises, the operations that will fix that. And here are all the pros and cons of each, which one would I think you should start with first. And we move on like that. Now, this test I've been doing for a long time, but I've slowly changed it over the years. And I want to explain to you why I do it differently to everyone else. So let's get on with that. So in the beginning, many years ago, there were two consultants from our institution, the Royal National ENT Hospital, that invented drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Froft and Pringle, their names were. And they wanted to find out what was going on inside someone's throat. And from there, they decided that we'd give a small amount of anaesthetic, sort of drip feeder into people, so that they had not a full anaesthesia, but enough to get them to snore and make that sound that we're all aware of. Now, it is an anaesthesia. It's a state similar to sleep, it's not really sleep. And I thought to myself, are there any differences between this state, which is similar to sleep, and real sleep? So uh, back then, you know, over 10 years ago, when I took over from uh, my predecessor, uh, the idea was to try and figure out if there was a difference. So what I did was I came into someone's ward at night and I saw these patients who had really bad sleep apnea. And I said, I'm going to put a telescope up your nose and, and I'm going to look at the back of your throat and I'm just going to sit there and just wait. And these poor chaps would lie there going, I'm not sure I'm going to fall asleep. But some did. It took a long time, obviously, to get someone who's so tired that they would fall asleep with a telescope up their nose. But this would be called natural sleep endoscopy. They became so tired. They just said, oh, fall asleep, start snoring away. And I recorded what was going on inside their throat, despite me nattering to them all night. And when I got that information, the next morning, I would do this drug-induced sleep endoscopy with the needle in the arm, a bit of propofol, the, the anesthetic drug. And I compared the two videos together. And I thought to myself, there are some differences between the two. And that worried me slightly, because if you're deciding what treatment option to give these people, you want it to be as accurate as possible. You want it to be exactly what they're doing at home. And I noticed that there were differences, particularly with the tongue collapsing back more in people who had a traditional drug-induced sleep endoscopy with the propofol being dripped in bit by bit. It's a lot easier really easy to just give someone anaesthetic and get them to the state where they're just snoring away and stopping breathing. But then I thought to myself, but then you could do that to anyone, even people who don't have snoring and sleep apnea. You can keep dialing it up until they do have sort of snoring noise and block off their breathing because it's just the drug that slowly shuts down your airway. And I thought to myself, that can't be a good test because you could make anyone snore. So I thought to myself, how do I make this more representative of real sleep? And the great thing about propofol, this drug that we use, is that it, initially, as soon as you squeeze it in, within a minute, it's in your brain, you start falling asleep. It works very, very quickly. But equally, once it's affected the brain, it leaks out of the brain quite quickly, which is why I have to keep giving a little infusion bit by bit, because if you don't do that, it comes out of your system and you can be woken up straight away. But what I thought was, why not really go for drug-induced sleep rather than just sedation endoscopy? And so what we're trying to do is trying to give them the drug and then wait for the drug to wear off. So I don't even look at the snoring and all that sort of stuff. I just put my telescope in and ignore everything I see on the screen and wait. I mean, at the start, I waited almost 20 minutes, half an hour, because most people can sort of be woken up after about 10 minutes. 
but I wanted to be 100% sure that the drug has come out of the system and redistributed for the rest of their body. I wanted to wait until I could say, uh, Mr. Smith, can you wake up? And they go, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to fall asleep. That's very different from someone who's really anesthetized. I wanted them to be as close to sleep as I possibly could. And once I've waited enough time, and as long as I don't move the telescope, or as long as the lights are all turned off, as long as they're on a relatively comfortable bed, as long as the machine, the anesthetic machine isn't beeping at us and everyone stopped talking, if you give someone a drug that makes them anesthetized, and as the anesthetic wears off, as long as you don't disturb them, they just carry on sleeping. We see this a lot in recovery units. You know, after they, you've had your operation, if it's not a painful operation, people just carry on sleeping afterwards until they are woken up. So that's what I wanted to recreate. So I give a small amount of anesthetic, the same stuff we give with normal drug-induced sleep endoscopy, and then I wait. I ignore all the snoring because they're not sort of waking up at all, and I wait till they can be woken up very, very easily. So I get as close as possible to real sleep. I want to get to the point where they can get up and walk out the room straight away. And I noticed the differences there. It was very similar to the natural sleep endoscopy where they uh, didn't have any drugs at all. I was watching them at night, no drugs, and they just fall asleep because they're so tired. It was the same. There wasn't so much tongue-based collapse as you see with the drug. The other thing I noticed that you saw the normal changes you would see and the normal cyclical changes you see with someone with obstructive sleep apnea. What I mean by that is that when someone has sleep apnea, they're their airway gets gradually worse and worse. So if you start off in relatively light sleep, you start falling asleep, you get deeper and deeper into sleep. Correspondingly, the back of your throat starts collapsing down bit by bit to the point where you go and you can't breathe, you lose a bit of oxygen, your brain wakes you up and you take this breath and then you start going, you become in the lighter stage of sleep and you go back down again. So you see the sort of sore tooth sort of thing that happens. You take a huge breath, you get your oxygen back a little bit, but then you go into deep sleep again because you haven't had enough sleep. And so your oxygen levels start dropping again till you have to have another breath to get yourself back up. You don't see that with a normal anesthetic. You just watch people get more and more sort of loss of oxygen. They don't try and save themselves. So you don't get this sore tooth formation. You don't see the cyclical change in their breathing. The other thing you notice is that people don't roll over. In normal sleep, if you can't breathe, people tend to roll over or just do this and try and get their airway opening again. Obviously, you don't see that if you're anesthetized because you're sort of stuck like that. And you just let this sort of thing happen to you unless the anesthetist gives you oxygen or something. The other thing you don't see is dream sleep. When you take propofol, this drug, it doesn't allow you to have dreams. That's why a lot of people who've been in intensive care for a long time have problems psychologically. If they've been anesthetized for a really long time, they don't get the dream sleep anymore. And that can cause all sorts of psychological problems. With propofol, you don't get dream sleep. But if you let someone sleep, and so I'm watching someone sleep, you can wait until they get REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. So I can see them dreaming because their eyes are moving around in their heads. And when you wake them up, they go, oh, yeah, I just had an amazing dream. And I, it was so nice, but it's, it's not normally, most of my dreams are about me choking or something like that. So this technique where I let it happen as time goes on and allow the drug to come out of the system before I start you know, analyzing the back of the throat, it seems more representative of real sleep, which is why I've changed it that way. And I think by doing that, you get some little extra information. It is an awful lot harder than normal drug-induced sleep endoscopy. It is so difficult to do. In normal drug-induced sleep endoscopy, you can cough, you can leave all the lights on, you can chat to your friends at the same time. It's easy because you're anesthetized. You're not going to wake up. In the way I do it, it takes a lot longer because you have to wait for the drug to wear off at least 10 minutes or so. And only then, if, if, you, if you can see the cyclical change, you see them sort of rolling over and getting struggling with their breathing, all that sort of stuff. If you can see that happening, then you know that there's you're getting close to the point where you can start visualizing the back of the throat. And the other things you start noticing is that you start getting better at working out which operations would work better. I've said before, I've got 43 different operations I do for snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. And they're all, you know, sometimes some of them are modifications of each other. But you think to yourself, hmm, I wonder which operation worked best for this person out of these three that work on this area. 
And when they take a breath in, you know, they're doing the cyclical sawtooth thing. If they go like this, and you think, ah, I can see there's a problem just there. And you see that their airways open up. You want to know which muscles are active, which muscles open up their airway first, because it's different in everyone. It's not the same muscles opening up for everyone. We're not all the same clone of each other. We all use different muscles. We all have different problems. Some people with stroke in their airway have different problems to someone who's a teenager who's got problems. So all these people have very different problems. And when they take that first breath in after an apnea, sometimes you can see that different um, different apneic um, uh, problems lead to different muscles opening up their throat. And you think, okay, that muscle's working, but this muscle really isn't working. Maybe I should focus on these muscles rather than that muscle over there. And that's more important because I think in the future when we get the Restira implant and all these other implants where you can target the things that you want to work on, you can fix those muscles which are causing problem and just leave the ones that are clearly working. You don't want to interfere the ones that are actually actively helping you open up. Um, I'm getting beyond myself. I'm trying to explain why I think this technique should be altered. It shouldn't be a drip feed anesthetic and trying to create a state that is close to uh, sleep. I think we should be aiming for real sleep. I want to be able to get the most accurate measure of what's going on inside the throat. I want to make sure I get the most accurate diagnosis because um, you're going to give someone uh, a diagnosis and say, you need these three operations. You need to lose weight. You need to do these exercises. You need to sleep in this position, all this sort of stuff. And it can take years. You know, If someone is menopausal, overweight, depressed, plus three, four different problems in their anatomy, you have to work on all of those things, including the diabetes and the high blood pressure, all that sort of stuff. And so you're edging them slowly towards normality. It's not one operation isn't going to fix someone with sleep apnea. It's far too complicated for that. But if you can say to them, this is what I think is going on inside your throat, we should sort out all of these things at the same time, bring you down. If you get that first diagnosis wrong, you'll be just pointing the wrong direction and you end up doing operations which aren't the right operation for that individual patient. Because like I said, everyone is a very slightly different constellation of problems inside their throat. And you need to make sure you get it right first time. Otherwise, what's the point? Why not just do trial and error like you know lots of people do? Just say, oh, well, I'll try this device. I've seen this on Facebook. I'll try this. I, I'm trying to get the, the most scientific, the best way to do this properly. I think I'm ranting now, but I hope that makes sense. I'm going to stop now, but thank you very much for watching this. Bye-bye.